Hello, everyone, and welcome to Below the Surface. I'm your host for today, Mike Goldgoff, and we've got a very exciting topic today in industrial security. And uh, joining me uh, today are uh, Reinald Pennings, who is a cloud architect with InnoTractor BV, and Stefan Schackinger, who is our product manager for network security at Barracuda. Welcome, gentlemen. Good evening or morning. Hi. Hello, everyone. Yes, it's a global world. Um, can you guys tell us a little bit about yourself and your role? Um, right now, let's start with you. Yes, well, uh, I'm a cloud architect slash engineer. I always say slash engineer because I'm also technical hands-on. Uh, at InnoTactor, we're an uh, IoT company, which has a primary focus on uh, solving issues in supply chains between logistical parties. And uh, we use uh, our proprietary IoT technology uh, with our SaaS to uh, uh, make things transparent and to streamline things. Great. Stefan? Yeah, Mike. Well, I've been with Barracuda since 2013. Uh, so it will be my 10th anniversary next year. First couple of years here, I spent as a consulting sales engineer. And in 2019, I joined the network security product management team, and here I'm working primarily on industrial security projects. Great. Congrats on 10 years. That's awesome. <laughs> so let's just turn to the subject of industrial security. And um, as you all know, there have been a number of high profile incidents in, in, uh, in industrial security uh, recently, and that really has put a spotlight on this whole space. And at the same time, we, we know many industrial companies are struggling with security. Uh, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges facing them? And, uh, you know, what are, what are the biggest roadblocks to uh, industrial IoT security? No, should I like go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please jump in. Uh, for, from my perspective, it's most of the time, it, it was never an area of focus. So uh, there's a lot of old legacy-based applications and chains in there. And there's also, um, uh, there was a lack of taking into account in the architecture of hardening all the right layers and uh, segmentations to make sure that you have a multi-tiered defense when it comes to the security of your infrastructure and your application, uh, your business applications. And uh, this is the issue that a lot of companies are now uh, are having to tackle because all of a sudden they are aware that they are lacking and that they need to do certain, uh, that they need to implement certain security measures. Yeah, absolutely. Stefan, anything to add here? Yeah, I completely agree with what Reinhardt said. Um, I think, yeah, of course, I mean, the issue has always been there. Um, what we see at the moment is a result of the changes that we've seen in the last couple of years. So the changes of network architecture. So machines are getting connected. Of course, digitalization is going ahead. is very important and everyone is connecting their machines and devices. But also we are distributing the workloads. So not everything is in the data center anymore, but we use cloud services. We use edge computing. So we have piece of the workload here, a piece of the workload there, uh, combined with OT specific requirements where availability is still more important than anything else. And that I think, well, leads to a world where our traditional perimeter based security approach does not work anymore. And just like, like Reinhardt said, we need a layered defense architecture to be able to stop an attack that has already begun. And that is the challenge here, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, you know, everything is changing so quickly. And in fact, just this year, we, we at Barracuda, we went out to um, industrial organizations with a survey, and we found that 94% of them have experienced at least one security incident in the last 12 months. And now, of course, we're, we're talking about industrial organizations here, in some cases, critical infrastructure type companies, right? Like the, these are energy companies, these are healthcare industry, these are key industrial facilities. So why do you think they're, they're getting hit so much? And, um, you know, why is that number 
so high and, and why so many uh, attacks are succeeding? Well, I, I mean, you could just yeah, answer probably it is still too easy uh, for the attackers to get in, right? Um, but also in our survey, we had 14 different industries that we included, and there's probably more out there. So I think OT security is not a niche topic anymore, but is a concern to many organizations in many different verticals. In, in fact, every organization that is not a pure services business will have something that relates somehow to OT or IoT devices. And this is where value creation happens and where it also really hurts them. Right. Yeah, and it's often also a very difficult topic. Eh? You need to look at the business perspective. Most businesses were focused on creating value and they weren't really prepared for the uh, for the shift that was happening all of a sudden when uh, cloud and all these initiatives really got, got traction. All of a sudden they were with these archaic infrastructures and archaic implementations uh, that had been running for years. And like you said, we've increased the attack surface by changing the way we're hosting and we're working with IT uh, and with OT. And in this case, I'm thinking also that uh, the biggest issue is that they weren't already preparing themselves ahead of the issue. They're actually being very reactive. And now most companies have to, uh, uh, to change their organization and transform their security profile while maintaining the existing running business and also educate all the people who are actually consuming those services or who are providing those services to uh, think in another dimension in the sense of that they need to keep into uh, account that from every perspective, there needs to be some kind of security measure there that allows for the right kind of, 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 of yeah, well, exposure without uh, uh, having those evil attack factors trying to take them down. Uh, and this is a very hard and, and difficult topic. It, it's for most people, I think it's a, uh, it might be like a, a, such a huge topic that they don't even know where to start. Right, right. So yeah, go ahead, Stefan. Yeah, I'd also like to add here that apparently the criminal organizations have discovered the market for themselves. And now the ball of industrial security and vulnerabilities is rolling. Of course, there's more, there are more vendors active in the market, uh, positioning their security solutions, more research is being done, more vulnerabilities are being discovered, which again makes it easier for the criminals to get in. And it seems to be in a very attractive market for them. Uh, plus, in addition, we do not really know how much of what we see on a daily basis is actually uh, nation state driven or a result of the geopolitical situation in general. True. Right, right, and and so I, I guess what is what is driving the need for security for these companies? And what I'm thinking of here is, of course, impact. What can be an impact if one of these attacks succeeds? Yeah, it's this could be very big, huh? Uh, in, in depending on what kind of uh, uh, market you're in, if it's it's healthcare, just imagine that your medical data might just leak out there because you didn't took the right didn't take the right measures. Um, or you have streaming data and you don't even know that it's being streamed or, or being tapped on and people are actually abusing the data or selling it on the uh, on the dark web. There could be so many aspects of how this could go wrong and is going wrong. Um, that's why there's so much traction now for uh, increased security implementations. Yeah, in our survey, we had in some critical infrastructure verticals, uh, such as energy, oil and gas, chemicals, or biotechnology, we had nearly 50% that responded they had either a significant or moderate impact. And the security incident in those businesses uh, can have a significant impact yeah, on the economy, on the environment, on people, on on everything, I mean, imagine something going wrong in the chemical plant that can have serious impl implications in the region. And uh, I think still the most popular example that we've seen, and I know everybody knows about it, but it's old but good colonial pipeline. And I think the damage to the economy at the US East Coast was by far more than the 5 million that they paid at the end of the day. Exactly. Mm -hmm absolutely massive massive impact and the one that uh, i always think about is that uh, water supply incident in florida where somebody got in and and, and changed the 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 level of a lie in the water like by 
I don't know, a hundred times or something. And so if, if that ever succeeded, you can think, you know, actually people potentially getting poisoned, right? Yep. Yeah, we had one case in Germany already a couple of years ago where a hospital was under attack and one person did not get the medical uh, treatment she needed and died as a result of that, which is super serious situation and very concerning. Yeah, yeah, very critical. Now, let, let, let's talk a little bit about the types of attacks. I think in, in our survey, uh, what came up was that web application attacks uh, were the most common attack vector. So is that is that surprising to you guys? And like, what what is driving that? I mean, why are web apps APIs particularly vulnerable here? And you know, is it is it because everything is moving to cloud? Are there other infrastructure changes? Like, why web application APIs? This whole space. <laughs> I, I don't think that cloud is the problem uh, here um, and also the result of our survey proves that cloud is not the security issue by definition in general uh, organizations that are more adaptive to cloud uh, will also be ahead with their security implementations or are, are more open to new technology in general but back to the initial question web applications I mean they're just common every organization has a web application in industrial environments, I think we're primarily talking about management and configuration interfaces here, which are either directly exposed on the internet or not, not uh, protected uh, in sufficient way. So in my opinion, I don't think the company website is the problem here, but all kinds of other web applications which are just being published. And as a rule of thumb, I always used to say, if it's not for public access, don't put it on the internet. Um, also in my experience from my previous job long ago, like you mentioned, but I did penetration tests before and I think just web applications are easier to hack than other systems. Yeah, and also yeah, you know, uh, one of the shifts that also happened is people started adopting and embracing the cloud. What they didn't really embrace, and I think this is the point that uh, Stefan made really clear, is it isn't the cloud. It is you really need to adopt the framework also that the clouds are providing. And most companies just saw the cloud as another data center and started doing a lift and shift because they were following a trend. And they exposed their APIs or their web applications, which were of a certain level or maturity, um, uh, all of a sudden to a very public strategy. And uh, they didn't take into account that they would need to take extra measures or even maybe re-adopt the whole strategy that they were at the original built uh, to be more uh, encompassing of what, re what it really means to move your infrastructure to the cloud and, and expose it. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Um, so uh, obviously companies look at that and they look at security and they even try to implement security. And one of the things that we found out that a, a large percentage of companies actually failed when they tried uh, a security project. I think it was 93% had some type of a failed security project. Why is that so common and, and what are the roadblocks to actually implementing it correctly? Yeah, as part of the survey, we got uh, many different roadblocks here that are problem and are not necessarily related to pure technology. So there are also organizational problems or, well, how should I say it? companies are just struggling to implement. Like we had organizations mention it, it takes too long, it is too expensive, nobody cares, nobody has the knowledge, it is too complex. So all kind of challenges that they are facing here, the pure technical solution itself is not necessarily the, pro the problem, but also those organizational aspects around it, except to choose a solution which is by far too complicated. Um, but also to address that, First of all, the IT security industry needs to provide solutions that are consumable and manageable for people whose core business is not in IT security, but like producing something. Um, and also, Forrester just recently published their best practices for zero trust micro segmentation, and there they clearly say that organizations go too big too soon. So start small 
keep going, keep iterating, like live security, implement something, and then continuous evaluations and improvements. But really start small and focus on something. Do not try to implement 100% security for your entire environment in just one project. Exactly. No more monolithic approaches because those are the ones that will fail because they're too big and uh, it's too complex, exactly. The, uh, there's a reason there has been a shift also in the development department to Agile and DevOps because you need to have a more strategic approach on how you do these kinds of things so that there's a, a, a way larger success rate in adopting uh, the right security profile in your architecture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so from a, from a technology perspective, uh, what are the, what are the most important needs for for companies? Like, what type of technology do they need to put in place in order to be successful? Lena, do you want to go first? Uh, this this is very various. You know, um, uh, there were some there was some uh, information in the report that really amazed me. We had a previous debate about that that the. Uh, uh, the lack of security is in there and the most basic, which is actually pre-cloud that's, that's not even implemented yet. I think uh, it's, it's a multi-tiered approach. The, the, the most common, of course, is not just isolating your, uh, your, your traditional demilitarized zone infrastructure, but thinking about a way more in-depth approach. You need to segment, uh, like you said, uh, Stefan, you already touched that subject with micro-segmentation. Uh, you need to think about that. You need to think about your identities as a uh, security layer. And you also need to start thinking about not just traditional firewalls, but also web application firewall implementations uh, um, in line between uh, uh, in, in each other so that you have, again, that multi-tiered defense going. Um, I'm guessing this is probably along the lines you were also thinking, uh, Stefan. Yeah, I completely agree here. Um, yeah, I think I think as as a result of the survey, first of all, the remote access solutions that organizations are using are super concerning, and there's a huge security gap in remote accesses. So that's got to be addressed first. Um, but like I mentioned before, uh, we're always trying to keep the malicious software, the malicious actors out of our network. And of course, that is the primary goal. We don't want to let them in. But like Reinhardt said, we need a layered defense approach that, well, is able to, to defeat an attack along the way. And on the local network, zero trust is the way going forward. And zero trust means to remove that implicit trust of something, a device or a person being on my network can do what they want by definition. So we got to remove that trust and continuously evaluate, well, who's there or what device is there and does that make sense? What's going on here? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, just, just even going back to basics, I think what we found out that some of the companies don't even have segmentation in place between their uh, OT network and their IT network, which means that, you know, you, your, your, you know, your salespeople will be on the same network, potentially that your, you know, maintenance for your industrial uh, machines. So uh, like how, that, that's, uh, that's pretty wild, isn't it? Uh, you know, not have network segmentation in place. Yeah. What I just said, of course, is, uh in an ideal world to some extent uh, the reality is different and also like we mentioned uh, begin where it's easy begin with the low-hanging fruits and the the basic implementation of zero trust in an industrial environment is micro segmentation because this is easier just isolating machines from each other uh, and then the following steps like authentication and so on uh, unique identification uh, will be will be succeeding steps, but the easiest way to begin implementing zero trust in an industrial way is micro-segmentation. And why that micro-segmentation? Because we have to understand how an attack on any kind of organization works. And this is not like an email is coming in, um, somebody clicks on the link and a second later, the entire organization goes down. No, there is a couple of steps in between and especially privilege escalation and lateral movement is 
the ones that we can address here, going from the email coming in or USB stick on the bucket and plot or web application attack, whatever it is, between that first step to the last step where the organization goes down and the criminals claim millions to resolve the situation. And in between, we can make it a lot harder for the bad guys to achieve the target. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, even yeah. I'm also guessing if if you do are if you are attacked and somehow they were easy, they were there was some kind of security leak that was uh, was overseeing your architecture by just defining micro segmentation you can also start thinking about damage control you you get the right tools to limit the amount of exposure that you're actually getting as a company nobody's perfect but um, it's all about having a strategy in place to uh, take into account not just that you that you'll be bulletproof huh, from every criminal that's out there to to get you but that you're also thinking about if it does happen to me, how can I control this? How can I manage it? And how can I uh, uh, overcome this without uh, the wrong kind of exposure on the public uh, uh, opinions also? Yeah, this could yeah, be really for, uh, first, I also say is that the attackers will pick the easiest targets first. And I, I think that is very fair. Now, depending, yeah, depending who you are, if you're just a victim of a widespread attack, the easiest target is the organization where there is the easiest way in. If organizations are in businesses where they could be targeted by a by targeted attack on themselves, where an organization needs to take down exactly that organization for whatever reason, then the organization, oh, sorry, the criminals are still going to pick the easiest target, but the easiest target in terms of the systems you have. So whether that be remote access or web application or whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So, so, and I think that the other uh, major attack vector that was highlighted in the report, which is before the threat even gets to the network, which is kind of remote access, which is basic if you think about it, like, even even put aside you know zero trust network access that you mentioned, Stefan. I mean, I think w what we found out is that a large portion of the companies had full network access for external users and did not require MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication. So you're talking about username and password to get onto the network to start changing configurations. Um, you, why why are people le leaving themselves so vulnerable? Do they not know? Do they not know how to fix it? What's going on here? Probably it has always been like that and nobody cared or nothing ever happened until now. Um, yeah, but like you mentioned, on average, about what, one quarter of organizations is just using a uh, username and password without any restrictions on uh, systems that can be accessed remotely. Um, in some verticals, even more, like up to almost 50% in energy. I think, um, well, it's kind of disappointing. We still have the conversation in 2022 about username and password not being sufficient. Of course, multi-factor authentication is a key requirement, but also use for remote access as a zero trust network access solution wherever it is possible. And it's not always possible, but if a traditional VPN solution is required for some reasons, because industrial protocols cannot be routed, or it could be various reasons, um, if that is necessary, we always need to restrict the systems that can be accessed and all traffic uh, should be inspected with security. Um, the reality is a different one. Organizations apparently are using screen sharing solutions, which are support tools, but were not designed for remote accesses, or they have jump hosts internally where somebody that is able to connect to the jump post can uh, just move around on the local network. And it is, well, the overall situation with remote accesses, according to our report, is quite concerning, I'd say. So I'm surprised that no more is happening here, or <laughs> I'm sure we will see more coming. Um, and this is really the low-hanging fruit where organizations can improve quickly by just using appropriate solutions for that and not, not tools that were meant for yeah, remote support for half an hour. Uh, they shouldn't like be open 24 seven. Right, right. So, so I think uh, 
a couple of other things that we found as challenges for um, many organizations uh, are just back to connectivity and, and scalability of their, of their infrastructure. Uh, w- why, why do you think that these are challenges for industrial IoT and what can organizations do to, to help address those? Reinhard, what's your experience with connectivity and scalability? Yeah, it also depends on where you're at. Huh? It's also uh, uh, based on your geolocation, of course. When you come to the Netherlands, we have excellent cellular coverage. We have a high density infrastructure in our country. So most issues are easily to be resolved. Uh, on the other end, there are a lot of countries that have, uh, uh, well, just uh, very limited infrastructure and, and in certain places, very limited connectivity. So this is always a big issue when it comes to resolving and building a strategy on adopting the right connectivity, right security measures without uh, um, uh, also somehow negatively impacting uh, the intended business goals. Um, this is something in our country, as in the Netherlands where I'm uh, living, uh, uh, thank God not a, a very big issue, but uh, I do know about some rural areas in France where this is a whole different ball game and you need to approach it with a totally different strategy. Yeah, you're a small country with high density. If we compare that to the US, it's a different story, I think. Exactly, and uh, it's everywhere. You need to take into account what, what kind of infrastructure is there. Most people just blindly assume that certain capabilities will be available. And then all of a sudden they don't and they start taking shortcuts because they need something because they already started the project without having the right requirements validated yet. Yeah, on the scalability side, I'd, I'd like to add, and I think it'd be best to give an example here just at our technical conference, just two weeks ago, I had a conversation with a customer who presented their case there and they uh, they produce sensors for railways, so they will be able to detect trains on railways and wild animals and elephants and all kind of other things. So when it comes to scalability, the first aspect is, of course, uh, organizations, especially in distributed environment, uh, in many cases have to deal with a huge number of devices, so sometimes hundreds or even thousands of devices that have to be managed and they have to be rolled out first and then they have to be operated. And the question in scalability really is how complicated is that and also how much technical knowledge does it require? So will an operations technician, an electrician, for instance, be able to um, to replace a broken unit on a Saturday night and, and uh, restore a backup of the configuration? And that particular customer gave us that example that with their railway sensors, there's sometimes in really remote locations where it will take a technician two days to get there to do something so you need a resilient and stable solution um, that just works and does not wait because you can't just go and and do a power cycle if things start to misbehave because it can take two days to get there yeah so there and their company the technician gets a shotgun and a knife and then they go there to by plane as far as they can and the rest of, of the distance is walking. So this is as complicated as it gets in such environments and, and therefore scalability as overall also considering uh, everything I mentioned is, is a key requirement. Yeah, exactly. And, and one subject you touched that's also very important is the automation part of this. Uh, in yeah. our case also, we as a company also noticed that if you uh, delegate your technology you can't delegate delegate the knowledge that's uh, needed to do that. So having solutions that can actually be deployed without any technical hassle uh, just increases your success ratio and makes scalability so more e- so much more easy because it's also easier to get the solution to the place or location uh, it needs to go without having to uh, find the right kind of skilled people to do it. Yeah, that makes so a lot of sense. That's a really important point. I totally agree there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, having automation in place is, is, is a very key point uh, to be successful here. So we talked about a lot of challenges. Uh, were there any good news in the report that we found out? Yes, there were. There are good news too, fortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to highlight that awareness for security in IoT and OT has grown 
massively over the last couple of years. So in our survey, the majority, I think about 70% uh, in, on, on average across all verticals, has either already implemented uh, security projects or is currently working on it. So the awareness has increased significantly. And by the way, this is also what Gartner just wrote in their uh, OT security market guide that was published just a few weeks ago in August. And there they also see that awareness has gone from like 40% one and a half years ago to more than 80% right now. So this is good. Uh, organizations are working on security and we were also able to prove that security actually works in our survey. So we can see organizations that have implemented security measures have uh, less severe impacts and less attacks than the ones uh, that do not have security implemented. Exactly. And there's also uh, uh, a positive sense feedback in that, uh, that you can see in the media that when attacks are happening, the people who have the right measures in place can actually fend those off yep. and show that they're in control of their environment and in such a sense uh, improve on that customer trust that we're all trying to build when we're building our services. We want to show them we're not just providing a service that makes lives better, but also it's being done securely and we're in control. Yeah, absolutely. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So people should keep working on their uh, infrastructure and securing it. So yeah, those are those are good news. All right, guys. Well, we we are coming to the end of the show. Any final thoughts or advice to our viewers? Yeah, from my perspective, I think the most important is if you're uh, thinking or are in the middle of a, uh, a migration in regards to your infrastructure. It doesn't matter if it's uh, still on premise or if it's moving to the cloud or hybrid. Um, make sure you start thinking or are thinking about the uh, multiple aspects of security. It's it, You need to think about identity. You need to think about multi-layered uh, security boundaries like a, a web application firewall. Implement next-gen firewall technologies inside your infrastructure. Segment all the information you have. That way that you uh, can always uh, uh, have some kind of impact management or at least assure that you uh, isolate uh, the impact on a certain level. Those are things that really in, in, in this age must be uh, part of your architecture and your strategy when you're uh, adopting technology or migrating it. Completely agree, Reinhardt. Very good points. Um, yeah, I always used to say if, if you started your OT security journey already, that's great. Keep going and keep improving. If you are at the very beginning of the security implementation, then get started, start small and begin with the low hanging fruits. Don't try to achieve everything at once and focus on something and yeah, be better than the others. Yeah. No more monolithic approaches. Those are bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Great. Well, uh, right now, Stefan, I'd like to thank you for participating here um, and leading the show. And um, uh, for our viewers here, you can go to barracuda.com to download a full report on um, IoT security. And you can also see our other LinkedIn live shows there at barracuda.com. And uh, I want to thank you all for watching and until next time on Below the Surface.